I would like to ask you to join me into memories of your childhood. And please think of one of those moments in which you were playing with friends for hours and hours. I expect this moment you just took in mind uh, had at least one of the following components. It was immersive. It was full of imagination and creativity. And one moment of play smoothly changed into the next one. This is me in one of my holidays in France in my childhood. And I was playing with the rocks and the water. I created uh, streams of water and a whole weather water management system. And for me, this is one of those moments in which the stones and the water provided me with this world, uh, in uh, this immersive world full of imagination. And I remember many of those moments in which, uh, uh, in, in which I played outside or inside, and I also loved to play with technology. I tinkered with electronics, and I played with my Commodore 64. And despite the fact that I was interested in technology, I was still, still unaware of the technological developments that were going on in the field of computer science at that time. Scientists managed to create more and more computing power, and other scientists started to use computers in their daily work. They started to uh, model all kinds of processes. Some of those processes uh, were focused on unraveling the complex systems behind biological and sociological phenomena. For example, the harvesting behavior of ants, stock market dynamics, uh, the arise of spontaneous traffic jams, and crowd movements in city areas. And because of the increasing computing power, those those uh, phenomena could, could be much more easily understood. Well, times have changed, and this is me now. And I'm currently working as a PhD candidate in the Eindhoven University of Technology in the Department of Industrial Design. And in a research team, I design, or we design, uh, or uh, we design, we research designs for play, how we can design for play. Traditional designs for play are often very defined. So take, for example, this game of chess. Every piece on the chessboard has a predefined meaning. And the, games of the rules of this game are clearly defined in the game manual. In fact, the design of this game includes the rules and the goals. We want to design for a different type of play, which is more open and less defined. For example, it connects a bit to free play, and see this girl in the woods, she picked up a stick, and this stick acts as a magic wand. Uh, she's acting out, she's a fairy. Uh, with this wand, she can do magic. But the same stick might also act as the sword of a mighty knight, or maybe a broom of a witch. It really depends on the game the children want to play. So the form of the stick, together with the imagination of the child, can create various types of play, uh, all with the same object. And one of my colleagues, Tilde Becker, started to design those, or started to research those, what she called, designs for open-ended play. In our research project, we also wanted to use technology, and we all know the immersive power of computer games. What we wanted to do is combine elements of this immersive technology with the free play in the real world. And I can imagine the resulting design can be objects that have no predefined meaning, uh, and it's really up to children what they're going to do with that. But how do we design such uh, objects, and how do we use technology in such a way uh, interesting interactions are uh, built into those objects uh, that can support open-ended play? And this is where uh, the 
computer science developed during my childhood starts to play an interesting role. In 1987, Craig Reynolds published a paper in which he describes the remarkable movements of flocks of birds. And I have a little movie I want to share with you. Uh, look at those birds. Uh, they move rather playful through the air. Ask yourself, is there maybe a leader bird in this flock? Or is what would happen if two birds collide, or two uh, 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 flocks collide? Well, Craig Reynolds investigated that uh, those flocks could be modeled by giving every bird in the flock a few simple rules to interact with nearby birds. And by only using those uh, few simple rules, the flocking behavior emerged. And there is no hierarchy and there is no central control needed to create the flocks. This is what we call a decentralized system. And I want to explain this type of system a little bit more by comparing centralized and decentralized organizations. This is a centralized organization. In a centralized organization, every object is connected in hierarchy. Because of this top-down structure, the upper object is always in control. A decentralized system is different. In a decentralized system, every object can communicate with other objects. And all the objects together, if they have the, the right rules in to interact with other objects, uh, can create remarkable behavior. Uh, those decentralized systems are proven to be scalable, robust, and self-organizing if the, the, the rules of those objects are set correctly, just like the birds in the movie I just showed you. I have a few examples uh, of the decentralized system which I want to share, and the first are grasshoppers. Uh, we all might know grasshoppers that create plagues. Uh, they eat all the, the food of the people. And sometimes if the food is gone, they uh, start to migrate to a new area with food. If they do so, they release pheromones. And other grasshoppers react on those pheromones and start migrating as well. And what we see is a phase transition between migrating and non -mi from, from mi non-migrating to migrating grasshoppers. For the other example, I would like your cooperation. Uh, in fact, you are going to show the example to me. Um, and this is an experiment which, which has been done before, but it clearly underlines the point I want to make. Uh, in a, mo a moment from now, I want to ask you to start clapping your hands. Just a little applause. Just a moment. And when I give the sign, I want you to start clapping in the same rhythm. Okay? Okay, here we go. Start clapping. <laughs> and rhythm. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, what happened here? You all were clapping randomly. And when I gave you the sign, you started listening to your neighbors and you started adjust your clapping speed to the sound you heard behind you and before you. And what happened is at the end you all synchronized uh, you all synchronized your clapping movements. So this is a synchronizing principle what we see in decentralized systems. There was no one in control. It just happened naturally. OK. OK. Um, I want to go back to play now. <coughs> and um, uh, what I have here is an uh, early pro prototype, which was created by Jos van Beek and Tilde Becker. And this prototype shows a light. And if I start turning this object, it changes the light. When I now shake it, I can send its color to nearby <coughs> objects. 
and this is this design is called the color flares. Um, uh, those color flares were tested on an elementary school, and uh, we noticed children came up with many games, uh, although those interaction rules are uh, fairly simple. Now look at this design for open-ended play. It exists of separate objects, and those objects can communicate. So basically what I have here is a simple decentralized system. And that's when we realized in our research team that perhaps those principles of decentralized systems might be very useful in designing interesting objects and interactions for open-ended play. And that's when we decided to make a new prototype, which I'm now going to show to you. Uh, this prototype is called the Glow Steps. And Glow Steps are interacting tiles. They have uh, microprocessors in which we program the interactions. And if I step on such a step, I can change its color. If I now walk over a line of steps, you can see I leave a trail of light. And perhaps I'm playing with a friend. And if I do so, we can decide that maybe we do a battle who can change the color of a line of steps the quickest. <laughs> but there is more. We also thought about how we could uh, implement options to create new forms of play. And therefore, we have to wait a little moment before my opportunity arises. Ah, there it is. You see this step is uh, in bright colors, and if I step to it, on it, I extend the colors over more steps. And this is an example where we use the phase transition principle of grasshoppers. If I agree with my friend to change more and more steps into this colorful setting, I somehow create a phase transition between one game to another. But there's more. You can also hear there are sounds. Well, not now. I, I'm aware, <laughs> I know this. Uh, this is a prototype, and prototypes always abandon you when you so desperately need it. Uh, <laughs> you get used to it. Oh, over here. There's another one. More and more sounds arise. And what you notice if you listen closely, those sounds are in rhythm. And that's why we used the same principle, the synchronizing principle, uh, we just showed in our uh, collaborative example. So, okay, this was a nice little play experience. Uh, so this is what we made. We made uh, interacting tiles. Uh, we also tested this with children on an elementary school, and again, we noticed a lot of different games arise. And we also noticed those decentralized principles really pro proved to create uh, a more variety in play. In a way, play with those close steps proved to be immersive, it proved to be creative and full of imagination, and one moment of play smoothly changed into the next one. But seeing this, what would be possible in future? Imagine yourself, we implement lights in city areas, so squares, parks, streets, and those lights can interact with people that cross it, cross the squares. Perhaps people leave trails and can start thinking of games. Perhaps people can influence those lights with our smartphone. I can also imagine swarms of light move over the square. And if you jump into such a swarm, you disturb the flow of it. Perhaps children start to chase the swarms. In a sense, I might even imagine that people start using those lights as I use the stones and the water in this river in France in my childhood. This city becomes, becomes covered with a ludic layer. It becomes a playful city. 
I would like to see that. So let's keep on playing with technology. Thank you.